Dr. Stillwagon, you, yeah, I, I appreciate you taking the time, and I love what you're doing, and I love how you you're continuing on this this good fight, uh, like with the aviation. You're mm-hmm. a pilot, yes, and a chiropractor, right? It's an interesting combination. Yeah, and 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 you're, even though your name is Stillwagon, which is like a wagon that's still, <laughs> which is. It's the antithesis of someone flying. Right. It's a German name, yeah. actually. Yeah. So, you know, I, I had a unique uh, life. I was able to be a chiropractor and an airline pilot. I've, I've got over 33 years of airline experience and uh, 21 years as a captain with Delta Airlines. And I've seen a lot of things happen over the years with aviation safety. And uh, also because of my medical background, I very clearly understand Uh, the dangers of these mRNA shots that were forced to go into pilots and all flight crews. Mm -hmm. And that has significantly uh, affected aviation safety. Yeah. And uh, I've actually done my my own research on this. Um, I did a a database where I investigated pilot deaths that were reported in the Airline Pilots Association magazine. And it's only... uh, about 2,500 or so pilot deaths that I've been able to investigate so far. So it's a small sampling. But I was able to determine very clearly that uh, when this shot rolled out in 2021 and it was mandated to go into pilots and flight crews, that there was a spike in uh, early pilot deaths. In other words, the pilots were dying uh, prematurely. Uh, dying prior to the normal retirement age of 65. And that was a 40% increase in the incidence of pilots dying younger. And I've got the database tied to uh, obituaries. The evidence is very clear. Also, I have uh, evidence that uh, pilots that are going out on long-term disability has also increased since 2021. And it's been uh, 300% of an increase. So that's concerning as well. All of these things have affected aviation safety, and the FAA knows it. In fact, they publish what's called a a safety alert for operators, a SAFO. And this came out in March of 2023. And this is notifying all uh, passenger-carrying airlines that, look, there's a, a signal here that aircraft incursions are increasing. Now, that means aircraft are getting too close to one another for whatever reason. Uh, It could be brain fog on the part of the controller. It could be uh, pilot error. Uh, It it could be a number of things. And um, also, it could be tied to this shot because uh, there's clear evidence that the shot can cause uh, brain fog, difficulty in concentrating, uh, things of that nature. So that, that came out in March of 2023. The very next month, uh, at that time, the uh, uh, chief of staff of the United States Army was uh, General uh, McConville, James McConville, and he grounded all Army aviators for one month. And he did that because there were uh, aviation accidents that were happening within the U.S. Army that were deadly and unexplained. They couldn't figure out why these were happening. Uh, It could have been sudden pilot incapacitation, maybe from uh, myocarditis. Uh, It could have been a seizure that that I'll talk about here briefly. It could have been any number of those things. Again, these can be directly tied to the actions of these mRNA injections. The signals are there. And, And listen, we know that this shot can produce Uh, myocarditis. And the problem with myocarditis is it can be subclinical. And so if a pilot is diagnosed with myocarditis, that's a a career ender. The pilot is not allowed to be issued a medical certificate because, um, you know, there could be the possibility of sudden cardiac failure. So it's it's a hard line in the sand and it's a safety issue, you see. So again, as I said, pilots are trained for this type of scenario where, where the, the pilot loses consciousness or even dies. We're trained for that. But what I'm saying is a, a more uh, dangerous thing could be uh, 
a, a sudden control input from a pilot because of a seizure. And we've had reports of seizures now that are starting to happen to pilots in the cockpit. Now, luckily, it hasn't caused, uh, you know, a, a, a flight control input that was unexpected. Uh, but I, I can tell you, Jonathan, you know, in 33 years of flying, I can tell you that if there is an unexpected control input that's put into an aircraft, particularly on the rudder pedals. In other words, if this pilot has a, as a, what's called a tonic seizure, where the leg goes completely stiff and, and pushes that rudder pedal clearly uh, all the way to the floor, a full uh, deflection of that flight control, and that leg locks, there's no way that that other pilot is going to be able to overcome that. If this happens during takeoff, the aircraft will leave the runway. It could hit another aircraft. There will be damage, and there could be people that are either seriously hurt or die over this. The same thing could happen on, a, on the landing phase. If a control input is put in like that, that's unexpected, and the other pilot cannot overcome that control input, you're going to have uh, a possible disaster. And so we don't, we don't want to see this happen. And so what we need to be doing right now is, is testing pilots to see if they've got any uh, indication that these physiological changes uh, could be going on in their body. Now, the physiological changes that I'm talking about are uh, things like microclotting, and we can detect that. Uh, we should be giving aeromedical examiners some guidance on things that they can look for uh, that would indicate maybe something's going on that we need to investigate here. So they have the ability to look at the retinal capillaries and see if there's any uh, clumping of red blood cells that, that's going on. And, and if there is, then we need to look a little deeper. They can also do uh, troponin eye checks. Uh, troponin is a uh, uh, produced in, if there's heart damage, and it'll show up in the blood. It's a very, very accurate test. Uh, troponin I and troponin T are uh, directly related to uh, cardiac musculature. So if there's damage there and this is picked up in the blood, that's an indication that this pilot has had some heart damage. Maybe we need to look a little deeper, okay? So what I'm saying is the FAA needs to take action steps now to start to look uh, for possible conditions like this, and they're, and they're not doing it. So I, I do plan to testify uh, in front of uh, a hearing in Washington, D.C., and talk about some of the things that need to happen here. Uh, one thing we need to do for sure is have an aviation safety subcommittee hearing, an official hearing, and we need to bring the FAA in, uh, the directors of the FAA that made the decision uh, to allow this shot to go into pilots. And that's in direct opposition to their guidance. Their guidance says do not allow uh, an experimental procedure or a medication to go into pilots. That's not allowed. And so they went directly against that guidance. Now, why did they do that? We need to find out why. Uh, in my opinion, it could only be three reasons. It, it could have been uh, financial pressure, which I doubt, it could have been a uh, political uh, pressure, which is possible because the FAA, of course, is a government entity. And if they were told from the Biden administration that, by golly, we're going to mandate this thing, uh, they just ran the, the flag up the pole and said, all right, we're going to go with it without even doing any further investigation or testing. And the third reason could be uh, fear. And by fear, I mean they fell for the narrative, the narrative that this was a deadly pathogen, and the only way out of this was going to be a shot called a vaccine. They actually believed that narrative. Now, anybody that was win within the FAA that was using any common sense at all would have seen that in February of 2020, 10 months before they said to get this shot, 10 months prior, the Diamond Princess cruise ship was quarantined off the coast of Japan. And all of those people were tested for COVID and tracked. And the only people that died were those that were 
elderly and comorbid. So pilots do not fit into that category. They're not elderly and they're not comorbid. So then the narrative was changed. The narrative said now, well, we should just vaccinate everybody because it will uh, stop the spread and it will protect others. Well, we know that those were a lie. Fauci admitted it. Burks admitted it. And anybody who was within the FAA in the medical department worth their salt should have known that also. These shots called vaccines are not designed to prevent the infection from happening. Mm -hmm. They're only designed to react to it, you see. So we need to find out who made the decision and why did you make it uh, so this this never happens again, because they will try this again, Jonathan. The narrative is that you need to put something into your body to create an antibody that's going to uh, supposedly protect you from getting infected and stopping the spread. That, that just absolutely does not work. So then we also have to have government oversight. We need to have a way uh, that the FAA can start tracking who got the shot, which ones did you get, and when did you get them? And why is that important? Now, that's important because, as I said before, we know that one of the significant adverse reactions of the shot is myocarditis, which can be subclinical, and that can ground a pilot. So the FAA knows this. Why aren't they tracking it? They should be. They should be telling us, and it should be a, a permanent part of a pilot's medical record. When, when did you get the shot? Which ones did you get? Okay. Another thing that needs to happen is we need to have uh, pilot incapacitations uh, investigated by the National Transportation Safety Board. Now, the job of the NTSB, uh, National Transportation Safety Board, is to investigate major airline accidents and figure out why they happened so that we can prevent them from happening again. But they're not required to investigate pilot incapacitations unless there was damage to the aircraft or damage to uh, passengers, you see, passengers that got injured, or if there was something unusual that happened during the flight, like uh, an uh, encounter with severe turbulence, or maybe there was uh, fumes in the cockpit that would incapacitate a pilot. Those types of things are investigated. But if it's just a pilot losing consciousness or having a seizure or having a heart attack, no, those are not investigated. But they should be. And we have the technology now, Jonathan, because we know that the, uh, the proteins that are created from the shot are unique. There are different proteins that come from a natural infection. In fact, the, the protein that comes from the Pfizer shot is different than the protein that comes from the Moderna shot. And so we actually have uh, the technology and the tests now that can determine uh, if those proteins are present in the body. And so that they should be looking at that to see if that protein had uh, a play in this. Now, they definitely can have a play in this. And the reason I say that is because these proteins that come from the shots are biologically active proteins. That means that when the protein is created from the messenger RNA, it will be secreted into the bloodstream, and now that protein is going to attach to cellular receptors. These are not inert proteins, like proteins that we eat or proteins that our cells are making all of the time and secreting into the bloodstream so that they can be taken up by other cells and used for normal body functions. Our, our bodies do this all of the time. And the message to make these proteins, Jonathan, is in our DNA. And that's how, that's how this, this whole thing works, is if, you're, if your body needs to make protein, okay, the DNA that's in the nucleus of your cell is going to be uh, transcribed into a messenger RNA strand which is basically like a long string of spaghetti. And it comes out of the uh, nucleus and it joins up with a ribosome. And there's a message in that messenger RNA. 
to make a protein. And that's how those proteins are made. But what have we done with this shot? We've made our own mRNA, you see? It's a modified messenger RNA that's injected into the body so that the body can make a protein that will be immunogenic. In other words, they want it to stimulate the immune system to have a response. Well, the danger in this, Jonathan, is you don't know how much of this protein you're going to make. You don't know what cells are going to make it. You don't know where it's going to go. You don't know if it's ever going to stop. Okay? So these, these biologically active proteins that are out there attaching to cellular receptors are going to create an immune response, and it's like an autoimmune reaction, you see. Mm -hmm. The body doesn't like that, and it will attack those cells and destroy those cells. And so that's where the damage occurs. So if, it, if it's happening in the heart, that can lead to the myocarditis. If it's happening in the nervous system, that can lead to uh, seizures. So I've, I've directly investigated uh, you know, seizures. Now, what, what, what can seizures be coming from? Well, it's, it's normally something that's gone wrong with, uh, with the brain tissue itself. It can either be uh, an inflammation or it could be a tumor that's occurred in the brain or it could be something with the vascular system. Maybe you've got a blockage or a leakage that's occurring in, in the vascular system affecting the brain. Or the last thing, it could be an autoimmune reaction. So let's take a look at, at all of those things and see how this lipid nanoparticle that they're using to inject the mRNA could possibly be doing this. So I've got a, a slide and you, know, you can put the slide in the background as I'm talking so that you can see some of the things that I'm talking about here. But the lipid nanoparticle that they use as a delivery system to get this modified mRNA into your cells, it's made of normal body fats. It's made of cholesterol and DSPC. And it was cleverly designed that way because when it's injected into your body, your body doesn't reject it. So these lipid nanoparticles are just going to go all through your vascular system and they will literally uh, merge with basically any cell they come in contact with because cell membranes are made out of the same stuff. It's lipids. And so when that happens, then what's inside that lipid nanoparticle is going to enter the cell. Now, what's inside that lipid nanoparticle that I just talked about are other lipid nanoparticles. They're smaller and they're self-assembling. Now, by self-assembling, I don't mean turning into nanobots or anything like that. It's basically that the, the lipids that they use are cationic. And so the lipid uh, is going to be positively charged and the messenger RNA that's inside of it is negatively charged. So they just automatically come together. But the thing is, they never told us how many of those little uh, lipid nanoparticles are inside of the bigger one. They never, they never disclose that, nor do they have to, because this, this whole thing is under emergency use authorization, which is entirely uh, experimental. They don't, they don't have to tell us. So anyway, these, those little, uh, uh, those smaller self-assembling uh, lipid nanoparticles are toxic. And Pfizer and Moderna use different ones, okay? Pfizer's uh, was called uh, ALC0315, and Moderna's was called SM102. They're both highly toxic. And if you look them up, you'll see that they're not even designed to be used in humans or even veterinary use because they're toxic. So what happens is the lipid nanoparticle the big one, that can cross the blood-brain barrier. So now you've got the problem of having these smaller toxic lipid nanoparticles being deposited in brain tissue. And they're toxic, and that will activate what are called microglial cells, which are basically the immune cells of your brain. And if you get enough of them deposited in there, then you start to get inflammation. So inflammation of the brain tissue can result in an unexpected seizure in a pilot. Now, seizures are, are a big deal, as, as I talked about, because it can cause an unexpected flight control input. We don't, we don't want, that, want that happening. 
So the next thing that I talked about was um, the possibility of a tumor. Well, how could that be coming from the lipid nanoparticle shot? Well, that was discussed by uh, several doctors recently. Uh, Dr. Uh, McKernan, I believe, was one of the first to discover that there was uh, DNA that was contaminating these vials. So, you know, when they first did this investigation of this mRNA technology, uh, they had a, a trial with uh, about 40,000 people in it. And 20,000 people were injected with uh, the mRNA platform. But the mRNA that they got was basically uh, a pure mRNA because it was generated by using uh, the same technology that the PCR machine uses. It just amplifies the, the, uh, the strand of genetic material that, that you give it. It makes more of it. The problem is it takes too long and it's too expensive. So the 20,000 people that, they, that got the real shot, they got basically uh, a pure, semi-pure mRNA product. But when they decided that they were going to roll this thing out and make billions of vials and ship this stuff all over the world, they had to have a faster way to make it. And so they do that by coding uh, the message uh, for the mRNA that they want in what's called a DNA plasmid. It's a circular uh, structure of DNA, and they put this in with E. coli bacteria. And E. coli bacteria will take in the plasmid DNA, and they will make copies of it, lots and lots of copies of it. And then when they get enough of that stuff, then they... Uh, they extract the DNA, and then they use uh, a substance called RNA polymerase to make the RNA out of the DNA. But here's what they did, Jonathan, and this is, this is where it gets really uh, nefarious in my mind. Instead of using uh, uracil, which is a normal uh, nucleotide that's used in messenger RNA, that's what our bodies make, when it makes messenger RNA, it uses uracil. They didn't use uracil. They used a man-made substance called N1-methylpseudouridine. Mm -hmm. And the reason they did that is it's less immunogenic. That means it evades the, uh, one of the innate uh, defenses that we have in our bodies to detect something that's abnormal, that should not be there. And these are called toll-like receptors. And our, our cells have these toll-like receptors. And there's uh, three of them that actually can determine if there is uh, RNA strands in the cell that don't belong there. Okay? They're toll-like receptors. Numbers 3, 7, and 8 particularly are the ones that have, that have the capabilities of doing this. Well, they found that if they use this N1-methylpseudouridine, they can make a strand of man-made RNA, and those toll-like receptors ignore it. Okay, so they're able to get this stuff into the cell, and the cell is able to start making the spike protein now, and it's the spike protein that's immunogenic. So they're basically hiding something to make something that is going to stimulate your body to have an immune response, you see. So the people that did that, they got a... Uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, in my mind, they deserve shackles. 